uh, this video I took, uh, I took from a post that I put up and also mentioned that I'd be making a video of it. It's, uh, basically, uh, are the conditioners up today better or what's the difference of the conditioners today that makes them better versus conditioners of the past? Uh, again, nothing meant for legal purposes. Same disclaimer. Talking about the past, and these are opinions, some are educated opinions, uh, knowledge, past knowledge. And uh, I'm going to give a little credit to the people who posted, so all uh, the uh, comments that I'm using from that post uh, will, be, will be from uh, those that, that put the comments out. So Bruce S. Morgan said... Uh, Supreme cardiovascul cardiovascular condition. The slower the heart rate at rest, the better shape one is in. Uh, less chance of adrenaline dump or, uh, you know, waste of, of adrenaline, you know. And basically, that's true. That's something that, that uh, has been researched and... Uh, what it means is at rest, just like standing still, what's the heart rate of a dog? Now, I would guess in the past, not too many people, if any at all, ever checked the dog's heart rate at rest or even working. And then afterwards, what's the heart rate? And then when they cool down, however long it took them to cool down, what's the heart rate at rest? So... Uh, it's a tool that can be used. That's part of modern science, uh, part of uh, understanding, you know. And uh, even though it was done by eye, uh, people were not uh, actually saying this is what it is, you know. Basically, you would just monitor the dog how it looked, uh, how it looked before workout, after workout. Uh, what's what's the breathing rate, if you will, and the heart rate during the workout, and same before and after. So that was a good comment with Bruce. I agree. Next one was some Sean Colwell. Uh, knowledge of yesterday combined with the science of tomorrow, the information that we have at hand. So, in my opinion, we can take what others have taught us or what we knew from the past and then apply the new science, the understanding, the meaning of it, uh, of today. And then as it moves forward, more information, newer information will come through. There's different venues that you can use because there's not a lot of information when it comes to the pit bull, competitive pit bull. Uh, there's not a lot of information uh, you know, in real time. But there's other sporting working animals like Iditarod dogs or greyhounds or thoroughbred racers or pacers or trotters, uh, you know, where we can use some of that information with, uh, along with the food products, supplements, and uh, conditioning methods that that could be helpful you know for example what did they feed uh, what where do they live what climate are they in do those things change depending on climate and temperature you know and uh, you can gather all this information and then always apply it to your dog you know uh, from what I understand I did a rod dogs uh, eat a lot of uh, eat at least most, if not all, raw feed, you know. Uh, I've seen videos uh, myself where they were giving them just raw meat and bones to eat. And then because of the cold weather, they would put a uh, warm or hot liquid broth with it, you know. And uh, mm -mm, uh, from what I gathered, you know, they did that so they would have, like I mentioned, they have a warm meal, you know. But they get the benefits of the raw feed and bones they're actually given like big rib 
pieces of rib in there with meat. And then they would pour the the warm liquid in, you know. Uh, the conditioning methods that some would use, even with game fowl, you know. How did they peak their animals? How did they train them? How did they condition? How much rest, you know. That's always been a factor, but now... Uh, in in more recent times, you know, you can time all that or you can check their heart rate. Physically check it. <clears throat> and I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff. Those, those will come out, you know. Randy White said, uh, getting better and smarter with science and technology. Uh, based, you know, which ones? Uh, natural ingredients. Does breeding play a part? I would say most definitely how the dogs are bred plays a part, who has them, what they do with them. Here's something I mentioned on a, another uh, chat. I think it was Samurai Kennels. I was on their program. And I used Bakary as an example. Now, I've seen him post and he posts, you know, pictures of his dogs, little vids of his pups, maybe uh, walking a, a male or female, you know. But just looking at the pictures, you know, just from my experience, I can tell that those dogs have breeding behind them. I can tell by their bone structure, their shiny coat, their thick skin, when they're walking, when, you know, if it's a video of him walking a dog or someone else walking one of his dogs. I can tell from the dog's focus, the shape of their head, their back, all this stuff. I can see the quality in those individuals compared to other ones I've seen, and I'm not going to name any names, that those dogs look soft or they don't have the athleticism if they're doing a video on a spring pole or a flirt pole or something or running them, you know, uh, or walking them. I don't really see too many uh, with people running them unless, you know, I have been sent videos of people that have used my keep and they want to show me, here's what the dog looks like. Is he doing good, this or that, you know. They all look good. People have done a good job with it, you know. And then other ones that have not used my keep. And the same thing, the dogs look good. But, you know, that's all part of how you raise them. How you introduce them. The intelligence of the dog. The ability to be trained or worked. Their work ethic. Their, uh, their structure, you know. This is something we used to say in the past, and Bach and I have talked about it. You have these little tiny puppies, and they look like full-grown dogs. That was something I noticed in some of my dogs. They look full-grown, but yet they're basically infants, a few months old. I can tell the difference when i just looking at a picture of a dog. Which one looks rugged and durable, which one looks soft and non-athletic. So that's something, you know, I implore people, check out pictures. Look at them, really, what are you looking at, you know? Like my buddy RF, I posted a, his mail up there. You can tell just by looking at the dog. Look at his focus, look at his head, look at his bone structure. Look at, at the way uh, he's built. It's different from a lot of the dogs I see today, you know? They have, these dogs I'm mentioning, these people, they have breeding behind them. It's turned it's, it's used over and over in the past and probably still used today. Meaning they come from good stock. Good healthy dogs with immune system. Good healthy dogs that have been fed right. Good healthy dogs that are exercised. And a lot of the people that I see that I respect and I see the same thing. They, they don't do what they did in the past. They're not competing anymore. They're old and retired. And But sometimes they make dogs available to others and they use them for hunting. And they use them for uh, uh, pest control, if you would, you know. So they're still functioning animals, and it shows because of their breeding, because of their how they've been fed and raised. It shows in the athleticism and the focus and the bone structure of the individuals. So that that to me makes a big difference. Uh, 
better, uh, Brandy said, better and smarter with science. That's part of it and technology. Finding out what can apply to your dogs, doing your research, and then see how it works with your dogs. Whether it's an exercise program, whether it's nutrition, whether it's supplement, feed, all that. Uh, and basically he said the techniques and method are the same. I've said that myself, you know. That part doesn't change just like the concept of conditioning or how to condition a dog doesn't change. Even though uh, the apparatus might change or you might find some new different technique to use different cardiovascular exercises different resistance exercises that are being used now you know but the concept itself and like randy said the uh, technique and methods th those are the same from the past up to today and they always will be kind of like a boxer they're always gonna hit the speed bag use the punching bag use mitts uh with boxing Punching more correct, using balance, teaching a fighter balance or movement, you know, some of that has not advanced because they're using science where they show how the body moves, what's the best place to position your feet, you know, like that. That can be done with the dogs too. Uh, um, let's see, Clem Stewart. Peak condition is peak condition. You have to know when you've reached it or passed it. Very good point because if you condition enough dogs or you go through enough conditioning programs, you know the difference between peak condition and not peak condition or uh, a dog being in shape or not too good of a shape. And once you understand where the dog's peak is, both physical and mental, and sometimes you have to make mistakes and pass it. You miss the keep where the dog is, has to go through that, that cycle of recuperation after reaching the peak. That's why sometimes if you miss the peak and you passed it, not missed it, but you passed it, that's where you see that cycle of the dog uh, doesn't have the same energy. The dog seems stale or lethargic, you know. Uh, so you have to know that difference to know where that point is. Just like in a workout, you have to know where the wall is with your dog or the past point is with your dog and you stop the workout before it gets to that point, before you burn them out, before you tax them so heavily that you ruin them, before you get them so tired that the next day they don't want to work anymore. They're, they don't have that energy to get out there and jump and do and run and all that that's where that lethargy comes in that's where that staleness comes in so you have to know the difference between the two to uh to know how to stop the workout when enough is enough before it gets to that point that's a very good point uh, uh comments from uh, clem amanda clannon now she made Several different points. I'm going to kind of generalize here. She brought something up that most people don't talk about. Uh, you know, I've mentioned it in different videos and on different chats and stuff, but it's not mentioned a lot. So I'm going to do it again here. Uh, she said overall increases in fitness and health, access to info, actual research and better products. Uh, <clears throat> and which is all true. Uh, in my last video, I mentioned all these uh, different products. Like, uh, you know, I said uh, Cytomax and, you know, Metabolol. And they have all these different ones, you know. Even the RF1 is another supplement, you know. And all this comes from people doing research and then applying it to athletes, whether human or animal, you know. But, for instance, if you're going to use carbs, one of the things that was introduced by Bob Fritz was Cytomax, you know. And the idea behind it is not all carbs are the same. Uh, the Cytomax or derivatives of it, maybe somebody else has developed the same product using similar ingredients but different or what, however they went about doing it, you know. Uh, 
with this Cytomax, you didn't get, you know, that fatigue from them, you know. You didn't get that lactic buildup like you can with other carbohydrates. So just like different fats, just like different proteins, different carbs, if you're going to introduce more carbs into your dog food, uh, there's certain ones to use and certain ones not to use. And that's where, like Amanda says, doing research and finding out which ones are which, which ones are different from the other ones, which ones are better than the other ones. That's all available now because with the internet, the information that you can grab is almost instantaneous. But, you know, the information has to be accurate. So you have to research, research, cross-reference, up, down, back, forth, sideways, and then see what you come up with. And then apply it to your dog and see if what the research tells you it's supposed to be or what's supposed to happen, if that part is true too. Something else that she brought up, uh, you know, the difference, one of the differences, be, be if you're raised with animals or let's say you're raised with pit bulls or any kind of animals, you know, uh, does that have an influence? Is that different from the past? I would say yes, because as we all know, not everybody, like in the past, not everybody has pets, not everybody has dogs, not everybody has working animals, horses, dogs. You know, whether it's sheep dogs or cow dogs like we had or hunting dogs, you know, that's becoming less and less. And when children are raised with dogs, they have an inherent understanding of dogs. Right. Because they're, the younger they are or from a young age, it's they're more influenced by the situation that they're in. They retain and receive information a lot easier than someone does th that they're older. They're easily influenced and they pick up on certain things without understanding. They don't have the knowledge or the science or the education to understand, hey, I'm learning this and this is what it means and all that. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that the kids are influenced. They inherently take in the information and as they get older, it's applied without them even having to think about it. Oh, I was raised with dogs, so I know this and I know that. They just basically do it. So that's one thing that I see different from the past and more current times is that pe uh, kids are not being raised with animals anymore. And in this case, specifically dogs and more specific pit bulls. That can make a big difference. And I think that's one of the benefits from the past that's not present in today. There still are some, and probably a lot of kids still are, but not as common as it was. In my day, everybody had a dog. Everybody, every house had a dog, you know, and sometimes more than one, sometimes a bunch of them. And they had them for different reasons. And, you know, because of where I live and, you know, California is a big agricultural country or livestock country, just like Texas is and a lot of the different places, you know, even places like... uh you know, Iowa or, or uh, you know, the more rural countries where agriculture and livestock has grown. Everybody had animals of some kind. And from there, you know, you get a dog when your kids, you know, even my kids, you know. Uh, my son had tarantulas, you know, snakes. A lot of people have different varmints. I know people that had, uh, you know, raised uh, bobcats and, and, you know, they have squirrels or they have a pet raccoon or, or they have uh, ferrets, you know, which at the time were illegal, but people would still get them, you know. So it kind of branches out into different animals, whether it's hamsters or guinea pigs or whatever. People that like animals, kids that like animals, they want to get more and they want to learn about this and that and do different things. Whether it's a fish tank or bugs or an ant farm, you know, you don't see a lot of that anymore. So that was good points and good comments from Amanda. Next one, uh, Señor de los Perros, says, depends on the person. There's advancement in knowledge and physical condition. Uh, take into account the old ways and then use new world technology and scientific information of today. Again, that's true. Repeated, you know, and the point he's making is that the methods and techniques of the past 
understanding of conditioning, you know, those still apply. You can learn that from a mentor. You can learn it from older dog man. You can learn it from doing research and reading their their uh, articles that they wrote or their correspondence they wrote between one another, right? And get an idea of what they're talking about and then use the new technology of today, uh, you know, to apply those methods, you know. Some stuff that wasn't used in the past was like uh, weights, you know, weighted collars, weighted uh, harnesses, you know. The resistance training, I've seen people like on bungee cords where they make the dog pull and then come back and pull and come back, you know. Uh, we always did the tug of war thing. I don't think that was done too much in the past. People just relied on a spring pull. But I found it better because you have two dogs almost in competition with each other pulling uh, against each other, you know, and working it. They'll shake it and work it and pull back. One will get the advantage, then the other gets the advantage. And they hold on. They don't let go. They learn to breathe through their nose. So that was put more into use from my day uh, to the present, you know. Uh, different types of spring poles, different training apparatus, you know. Uh, some the, the like the treadmill there's different kinds of treadmill there's e-mills and there's carpet mills and slap mills and mills that have a break on them and different sizes and different materials right but the treadmill has been around since the 1980 uh, 1890s you know when sears and roebuck advertised it in their catalog dogmen took that at the time it was new technology and then applied it to working their pit bulls so that can still be done today. There's always innovations, people thinking outside of the box. What can I do with this? I have limited space or how can I do this? You know, a lot of swimming is done. People don't live near a river or the ocean or whatever. So they use a swim tank to swim their dogs, you know. So uh, things become innovative seemingly, even though it's something from the past. You know, in the past, we just go up to the hills or go out to a lake or uh, a canal or something. Let the dogs run through it, let them swim, this and that, yeah. And others that don't have that, the time or or live near all that stuff, you know. Like where I live, there's two lakes within 15, 20 minutes of my house, right. But some people, especially in, uh, live in big cities or they don't have lakes around or rivers and all that stuff. They just came up with the invention of using a, a swimming pool. Or it's store bought, or they made their own, or whatever it is. Get the same effect, same type of workout, and uh, took care of the problem if they don't live near a lake. So uh, the next one we have from uh, 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 my friend, the coach Leo Cry. Learn from the past to make the present better be it success or failure, right? So basically that means, you know, take the successes of the past, apply them to today, learn from the failures of the past, past, and uh, don't repeat them, you know? Some people are stubborn. They won't listen. They don't listen to their mentor. They don't listen to older dog men. Uh, they want to learn on their own. That's fine. I understand it. They could help themselves move along a little quick, quicker if they learn from someone who's experienced, tells the truth, and has uh, that experience to back up what they're telling you. It can help you. You don't have to do what they did wrong. But either way, if you make a mistake, that's learning from your past because the mistake is in the past, even if it was yesterday, right? So that's what that means, learning whether it's a success or a failure. He also gave a, a number of... Uh, of statements and I'll read those off. Nutrition is more readily available and taken more seriously. Aftercare has gotten better. Medicine care better for recovery. Uh, you know, all that's true. That part, the knowledge is increasing. Back in the day, there were only certain people that had that aftercare knowledge or even medicine. Uh, there's more medicines, dewormers, and antibiotics available. So that much is different. And a lot of people 
whether they learned on their own or they had help or they researched it, can help better with aftercare or just applying, uh, you know, administering medicines or shots or whatever it is, you know. You can learn a lot of that on your own. Even hooking up IVs or what medicines do what or whatever it is, you know. Uh, nowadays, you know, even like with parvo, coronavirus, something like that, a person can learn how to administer, uh, you know, uh, IV solution, you know, lactated rearers on their own to help save their pups, you know. It doesn't have to be like in the past after a fight or anything like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking in real world time what you can do for a sick animal and learn how to uh, administer and apply uh, lactated ringers and then what antibiotics or dex or whatever you can uh, include along with it. Uh, he also said the ability to communicate and network uh, more people that help. You know, that's true because uh, people are more willing to share that information you know available uh, the availability is almost instantaneous which like i said the it's almost right now you know you can communicate with others or you can look stuff online and the information is bang right there uh, uh <coughs> there's less uh myths and misinformation and if you're not sure what is true and what's a myth, you just have to do your research and find out. You know, two institutions that I always uh, talk about are Merck Veterinary and the Mayo Clinic. There's a lot of good information there. Uh, so these are some of the things that Coach put up. Good. He has a lot of experience. He's retired too now, you know, older. But he has a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. And he shares some in my group, too. And, you know, he's asked me for help. I've asked him for help. That's part of that network. And even today's time, just, you know, because we have such an interest in the breed. Jorge M. Garcia. Longevity of conditioners. Longevity of conditioners. conditioners. Uh, many were around back then and learned from their mistakes. That's something that... Uh, I saw in my time over a period of several, several years, you know, and here's one thing that I want to talk about is, you know, when something's starting out, someone is starting out as a competitor back in that day or a breeder back in that day, right? If you were to look at their record in the beginning, it may not be that good. The dogs they have might not been up to par to the dogs they got later, or they might not, they might not have been available then. But as you gain experience conditioning dogs, you get better and better at it. And that's what I think Jorge is talking about. You start off, you may not be that good. But if, you have, if you're determined and you have patience and you have the time and you want to take the time and you persevere, you're going to get better at it. You're going to get better at breeding. You're going to get better at conditioning. That comes with the time. So some of the people in my day that were older maybe 10, 20, or even older than I was, were real good at it. But you have to take into account, when they started, they weren't real good at it. They got better with time. And if you continuously do something <coughs> over a period of time, you're going to increase exponentially over that period of time where you're going to be a top competitor. And you may be 40 years old, you may be 50 years old, 55 or 60 years old, at the top of your game. That comes from all those years that you put in. So tons of times we have to see, like if you're going back in the journals and you may see somebody that's quote unquote famous, right? If you look at their earlier match reports, they may lose more than they win. Or they may not have as many matches back then that they did later on. And then you see them coming to up and peeking out and Several matches over a period of time, they win a lot more than they lose. And uh, they're at the top of their game. That's happened with almost everybody, myself included. You know, I didn't start off too good, but I ended pretty good. You know, a lot better than when I started. Once I learned what I was doing, I got real good at it. And I applied it in open competition. So uh, thank you for that, Jorge. That was uh, 
something that I hadn't really thought about too much, but it does come up and it does matter, and that's generally how it goes. Uh, some people, right from the jump, they get good dogs, they have a good mentor, or they have a good understanding of condition, they know what they're doing, right? And they have great success right from the beginning. That doesn't happen too often. And uh, those are exceptions, and uh, they should think they're uh, lucky stars that uh, they were in that position to benefit from it. But it doesn't happen to everybody, almost nobody. You have to learn. Unless you grew up with it, you know, that's another benefit. Some people are children of dogmen. Some people are related to dogmen. And uh, they have that benefit. Or they befriend them when they're younger, you know. And then dogmen take them under their wing. And they're good almost from Jump Street, you know. But within that, too, you're going to learn different stuff. And the guys I knew that, that were good at it, you know, you have two kind of people. Both successful, so I'm not making a comparison of which one is better. You have an old-time dogman, older dogman that has a lot of experience. That understand once they got their conditioning and feed down, they don't change everything. The attitude is if it's not broke, don't fix it. That can, that has happened, it does happen, and they're successful. I can't argue with it. I have another friend who's a dog man, and he was always advancing in that if he found a product that he thought might help him, he would include it. If he found something that he considered better than what he was using, similar to the same product he's using, but better then he would change it. And they might even change their feed. Or they might be given all beef in their keep. They might have changed from beef, straight beef, to beef and chicken. Or beef, chicken, and fish. Or beef and fish. Or chicken and fish. Or chicken and lamb. Whatever it is, <clears throat> they're taking this new understanding and new technology, new science, basically, and applying it. And I see that more so with the supplements. Where they may have gave this product. They found something better. Whether it's, you know, help dog breathe better. Or help them recoup better. Or help them uh, build more strength without bulk. Or some want bulk, whatever. But uh, it's more so the nutrients. the Not the nutrients. The supplements that change than I see than the feed. you know, And the feed will change too. Some have gone from uh, kibble and meat to, say, all raw, you know. And some use kibble and raw. Some use all raw. Some uh, uh, use no kibble, all cooked food, you know. It just depends. But, you know, there's always that. With him, there was always that thing. He wanted to learn more and apply different things and see what worked better. If he liked it, he kept it. If he didn't. He didn't use it anymore. So there's those two schools of thought. One is not better than the other because they both have success on that same level, high level. So it's just something to think about. Thanks for that, Jorge. Uh, Rico GDI came up with something that said conditioners today would outshine those of the past because of knowledge, nutrition, sports performance. Right? True. That's true. Not in all cases. But it's true because I look at it like this. When I see over my time in the dogs, when I see those guys from the past able to compete on a high level later on in life, they were real good back then. They're still real good now. Right? So that depends on the person. That depends on their knowledge and ability, right? And it's kind of like saying this, you know. Overall, you could say, yes, that's true. Because some people don't advance. And there is newer, better things, certain things, now than from the past, right? But if we're speaking of conditioners at the top level, and dogs at the top level, say Black Jack Jr., for instance, who was around in the 30s or 40s, whenever he was. 
Could that dog compete in today's time? Yeah. Yep. Could Uller Tudor compete in today's time? Yes, but again, going by what Rico says, they, Earl Tudor would have had to advance also. He would have to use, learn to use new techniques, not new techniques, new nutrition, new science like that. Right? His conditioning methods would have been the same, but he would have to have advanced for the times. Whereas with the dogs, it's a little bit different. A great dog back then is a great dog now. Tudor Spike could still compete today. Zebo could still compete today. Black Jack Jr., right? But dogs at that level could still compete today. Now, overall, maybe the dogs uh, have advanced more today, and a lot of them from back in the day couldn't compete. But there are a lot that still could have. With that being said, at the same time, could dogs of today go back and beat those great dogs like I just mentioned? Are there dogs, not, not today specifically, but later on after the after those dogs' time, could they co go back and compete on that same level or even beat them some of them dogs? Was there a dog later on that could beat Art or Zebo or Blackjack Jr.? I would have to say yes, or else there's no advancement. But where I see the advancement, just like in the breeding and the breed as a whole, I see it individually with the persons their self. Meaning, uh, the individual, a breeder, let's say, he gets better, therefore making his dogs better. A competitor, he gets better, therefore making his keep better. His conditioning better. As a whole, has everything like that, breeding, conditioning, feed, nutrition, like that. Are they all at the same level? I don't think so. You know, I don't think so because you have to have the knowledge to apply conditioning and nutrition and supplements. You have to have the experience to know how to breed and how to advance and how to evolve. So as a whole, just like it was back then, no. But individually, yeah. Because even back then, only certain people were competing. Even though someone like Colby made the dogs available worldwide. I mean, Colby was sending dogs to Mexico. He was sending dogs to South Africa. So... He was sending them all over the place. And there were a few others that did too, or at least throughout the United States. But more people per capita competed with the individuals, with the dogs herself, than they do now. So you may not agree with me. You know, it's just an observation. It's just through research what I've done. So, uh, you know, I agree with Rico, but then I also pose that, that, uh, the question, you know, basically, uh, the best advance with the times, uh, experience over time, wins more often than not, using new products or the same feed, and that's what I mean. You know, they can apply the products that are effective and use them, right? <clears throat> or use. Can they use the same feed they did back then as now and still get good results? Both statements are true, in my opinion. Uh, Scott Flooper posted something I thought was, was pretty good. It says, dogs should be better now based on nutrition and supplementation or the progress of nutrition and supplementation. But they are not. Good dogs in shape can transcend eras. And what he means by this is in the past, there were less dogmen and dogs, but more competition per capita. Something I kind of just mentioned. Uh, today, there's more dogmen and dogs, but less are competing. Uh, meaning... You know, conditioners are down percentage-wise. I don't know if that's true or not, but 
it very well could be. And I can attest to the fact that in the past, even though there were less people that had dogs, less people were that were actually competing with the dogs, percentage-wise, there was more than in later years because you have the dogs spread out in later years, more people having them, but the number of conditioners, percentage-wise, was less later on than it was in the past. There's millions of dogs throughout the world. M millions of dogs throughout the United States. And, uh, but they're not all competed with, you know. Back then, most of the people that had them spread out through the U.S. did compete with their dogs or sent them to people that competed with them. So that's one thing I agree with and I see a difference, you know. And like I always mentioned, today's world, just like getting back to the first part of the video, you got to do stuff with your dogs. They will lose athleticism. They will become thin skinned. They'll lose bone structure and muscle and uh, prey drive and intensity and intelligence and air and all these attributes we give to the dogs if you don't do something with them. Hunt, legal sports, regular exercise. Put them through different tasks that make them think about different stuff, you know. Uh, see how trainable they are. Train them to do different things. That's what's going to keep, through breeding, the best individu individuals that are good at all those things, that's what's going to keep your dog at a higher level than someone who just has pit bulls and breed pit bulls and looking at the peds and all that. And like I said, I can see it. I see it just looking at a picture or a little video. The a lot of dogs look soft, and I don't mean to insult anybody or make you feel bad, but that's just my observation. And one thing I can compare it to is show dogs. A lot of show dogs, different breeds, they're not the same. They don't do what they were bred for. So hopefully that won't happen to the pit bull, and I'm sure it won't. Uh, on a smaller scale, on a larger scale, maybe, you know, but uh, that's all I have. I want to thank everybody who commented on my post. I thought I'd turn it into a little video so I can talk more about it. Hopefully it helped. And you can contradict me or you can disagree with me or agree with me. Just put it in the comment. We'll have a little conversation about it. Once again, thank you.